Now let us go and start with uh, <coughs> some other important topic uh, in, in, in the designing of the instruction set. Like how do you decide the number of registers, right? For example, Intel, the architecture you are seeing has 8, eight general purpose registers. But there are risk architectures which have 128 general purpose registers, right? The number of, so this is I, how do I decide, this is the question that we would like to answer. How do I decide the number of GPRs? GPRs essentially stands for general purpose registers. You had seen an architecture in the uh, previous semester where you used only two registers, correct? It also worked, right? So let us now debate, like I just want to have a discussion now on what are the factors that will influence the number of general purpose registers? What are the facts, uh, the basic operations that we could do because we couldn't do division back in, how we are able to do division because we have EDX, EX and so the first question here is that we have already seen what is a load store architecture versus a normal uh, uh, non-load store architecture. What is a load store architecture? Only two instructions can touch memory, one is load, another is stored. All the other instructions work with registers. If that is the case, then we will need lot of GPRs. So in a load store architecture, we will need lot of GPRs. Many of the risk instruction architectures are load store architectures, right? Why, why should risk instructions be load store? Why, why should the risk ISA be load store architectures? Because they are of fixed length. Almost all the instructions should be of fixed length. So I cannot afford to have memory operands along with registers. If they are constant length, I should know where the destination is, where the source operands are, my decoding should be easy. So if I have a load store architecture, all these things become easy. So many of the or almost all or all the risk architectures are indeed load store architectures. The moment I have load store architectures, then I need to have lot of general purpose registers because only two operations can use memory as an operand. The remaining things have to use register as operands. Right? So that is one first part. So there is a need for risk architecture because my execution will become faster, my decoding will become faster. The moment I have risk architecture, then it is of fixed length. So I would not like to have uh, too many types of operands there. And so, so to make my decoding easy, I go through to the load store architecture. And the moment I have load store architecture, I need lot of GPS. So this is one story, right? Now, <clears throat> what will happen if I have lot of GPS? Okay. So let me just take the next point here. So a GPR, all the GPRs are stored in something called a register file. Okay. An advanced course in uh, uh, computer architecture will teach you how to design register files. Right? So there are many registers in this register file. So when will this register file be accessed? Whenever I want to fetch data or whenever I want to store data. So there are five stages in the execution of instruction. Fetch the instruction in which register file will not be accessed. Ex uh, decode the instruction. Fetch data. At that point, the register file will be accessed. Execute the instruction. Again, register file will not be accessed. While I want to store back the data, again, register file will be accessed. So at two points, the register file will be accessed. And when I want to access the register file, I should basically say which register I want to read or write from. In the case of data fetch, I am going to read. In the case of writing result, I am going to write. So I should tell which register I need to read or write from. Okay. So, so what I do, I give an address for that register. So let there be eight registers, say R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7. I have three bit address for this register. 
these three bits are basically decoded to find out which register I should enable, right? So register that's always an enable bit. Then only you can go and read or write from it. So which register to enable will be done through this decode bit, correct? Right? So that is a decoder. Now, if I keep increasing this, so this is now what? 3 to 2 power 3 decoder, right? If I have a 128 GPR, it actually becomes 7 to 2 power 7 decoder, right? As I keep increasing my number of GPRs, the decoding will become more and more complex, right? So what, it, what I mean to go and access the register file? Again, access means read or write. Okay, access is a common word used for read or writing into any resource. What do I mean by accessing the register file? I need to give the address of the register and then I have to go and access it. After giving the address, there is a decoding happening which basically tells which is the register, which is the register that you want to go and access to. It goes and enables that register. And the decoding happens from a k to 2 power k decoder. So the total time to access the register includes this decoding time. Are you able to follow? Right? So if I keep increasing the number of GPRs, what will happen? This decoding time will increase slightly, but it will be logarithmic, but it is it will increase. But very importantly, the area of the decoder will exponentially increase. Right? Because I need 2 power k lines. Right? So the, there is an exponential increase in the total area that is uh, required to implement the decoder. So as I keep increasing my registers, uh, the number of registers, what could happen? I will land up with a circuit with consuming more power, more area and also less performance right? because the depth of the circuit also increases. Right? So, this is the other side or implementation side problem with number of GPRs, right? So, so, so there are plus and minus of how many GPRs should I include, okay? Right? So, if I include lot of GPRs, let it be there, then lot of power area is getting wasted, and your performance also will take a hit. But in the same time, if I have very less number of GPRs, what will happen? Suppose I am computing with say 10 variables, right? if the variable is in the register, then I consume say 1 unit of time, if it is in the cache, I approximately consume 5 units of time, if it is in the memory, I consume close to 50 units of time. If a variable is in the register, it is very quick for me to access, if it is in the cache, it is 5 times slower, if it is in the uh, memory, main memory, it is 50 times slower, correct? So what will happen is, if I have lot of operands which I need to operate upon, lot of variables, the compiler would prefer to have it in the registers. All the variables that need to be used in the near future, the compiler will try to have it in the <coughs> registers because quickly I can keep accessing it and after I finally say suppose I am having something like A equal to 1 and there are many, many F1 of A is computed, F2 of A is computed, F3 of A is computed and then finally, uh, you know, at this point. So right from this point A equal to 1 till I finish computing F3 of A, the compiler would like to keep that variable A in some register. After that, it will go and update into the memory. After end of this, you can go and say move that register into memory or store that register into memory. By doing this, what happens? Every time I want to access A for computing F1, F2 and F3, that A will be available in the register and I will get it very fast. If it is not there in the register, then what will happen? I have to go to memory which will become 5 times or even 50 times slower depending on whether it is in the cache or not. You are getting this? Are you able to follow? Now, if I have lot of variables and very less number of registers, then what will happen is at some point of time, I do not have enough registers, so I will be forced, the compiler will be forced to move the variable back to memory. 
for example, suppose I had only 3 registers, suppose I have only 3 registers, but I have I have say something like A equal to 1, B equal to 2, C equal to 3, D equal to 4. I want to compute F1, A, B, C, D, F2, A, B, C, D, some function F3, A, B, C, D. I can store only A, B, C. So, when I am computing even F1, I will first compute part of A, B and C and assume it is a load store architecture. right? I will I will first compute A, B, C keeping them in register, then I have to remove off some B out to memory and bring D from the memory and then finish the remaining part of the computation, right. And then similarly, when I am doing F2 or F3, every time I need to do this, okay. I do not have enough registers to maintain my temporary, vari my variables there. And so, as a, as a result of it, I go and write back some variables to the memory and fetch it back whenever it is necessary. This is, this is called register spilling. Okay. Register spilling is the, is the, is the, is the name for this, this phenomena where I have limited GPRs, general purpose registers, I have more variables that I would love to store as in the general purpose registers because I am going to use it in the near future, but I do not have enough registers. So, what happens is at regular intervals, I have to go and save some of these registers into memory. That means, the corresponding variables I am storing back into memory and fetching the new variable from memory to do, do these computations. And this becomes very important if I have a load store architecture, because in normal operations like add, subtract, division, multiplication, I cannot use, uh, I cannot use general purpose register, I cannot use memory operands. So every time I want to do any computation, then I have to put that operand into a register. And if I don't have enough registers, then we land up with what is called as register spilling. And because of register spilling, what will happen? Your performance will degrade because every time I have to go to memory and bring it from memory. Your compilation also will become extremely difficult because when, when the compiler is generating for example, uh, the code for A, B and C and D, it does not know. So, it, it has first, first fetched A, B, C. Should I fetch A, B, C or B, C, D or A, C, D or A, you know uh, B, C, D, I do not know, right. Which combination should I keep? And when the new variable has to come, which should I evict? So, all these type of things has to be done by the compiler when it is generating the code. Are you able to follow this? So, that also, so the compilation also becomes extremely difficult when I have less number of GPRs, right. So, register spilling really kills, okay. So, the objective is now is that, so as I, as I keep on telling you, computer science is also communist science. If you get something, you lose something. There is always an act of balance. And that is why this course becomes interesting, right? Any, any course in computer science becomes interesting, right? So, today I have lot of benefits by having GPRs. I have lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems while maintaining these GPRs, right? So, how do we strike that balance? I cannot have too much. I cannot have too small. So, what is it? Why should I have 128? Should I not have 64? Can I not have 256? So, how do you come out with this decision? And that is very, very important. And the ultimate objective is that I should not overdo it, nor should I end up in a situation where I am having register spilling. Correct? Is it, is it fine? So, how will we solve this problem? Okay. So, I am going to go. So, 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 somewhere I am trying to collect algorithms, graph theory, and all here. Okay. So, normal computer organization course does not teach these things, but I will teach you these things because these are very, very important and crucial because how architecture is designed using some of your theoretical uh, fundas. Okay. So, let us go back. So, let us now start what is a graph. Okay. Palagat, tell me what is a graph? Collection of vertices. So, graph G is a, is a tuple V, e 
where V is a set of vertices and E is a set of edges connected to them. Okay. Now, <coughs> let me introduce a, a new type of graph called interval graphs. Okay. So, let this be the uh, number line or this be the okay, this is a number line. So, I draw several intervals. Okay. Each interval in the line would be some starting point and an ending point. So, how many intervals are there in this uh, stuff? There is a1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6. Okay, there are six intervals. Now I construct a graph using these six intervals, wherein every interval represents a vertices, vertex. Every interval represents a vertex. So how many vertices will be there in my graph? Six vertices. A1, A1, A2. A3, A4, A5, A6. Now, there exists an edge between any vertex i and j if the corresponding intervals overlap. Right? So, there exists an edge between vertices a i comma a j if and only if intervals corresponding to a i comma a j overlap. Okay. Now, <coughs> a 1 a 2 there is an edge, a 1 a 3 also there is an edge. Then after that, no other edge from A1. A2, A3, there is an edge. A2, A4, there is an edge. A2, A5, also there is an edge. A3 to A2 only, there is an edge, nothing. A4, A5, there is an edge. And A5, A6, there is an edge. Let me define uh, a variable. A, a, term, a term called click. What is a click of a graph? It is, a, uh, it is a subgraph that is completely connected. It is a subgraph that is completely connected. I want to have the maximum click here. The maximum click of this graph is 3, right? A2, A, A1, A2, A3 is connected. Take, right? You can't find four vertices such that every one is adjacent to every other, correct? And I can't find, so the maximum size click is 3. Okay. So, <clears throat> I leave it as a very simple exercise. What you need to do is you will sort all the intervals in terms of this end point, starting point and ending point, in terms of the starting point, and then just go, do a traversal from left to right. So, what will happen? A1 is added. Okay. Now, what is the max click I have seen so far? 1. Right? Then A2 start point. So, this is called left point and right point for every interval. A1's left point has come, so A1 is added. A2's left point has come, it is added. So, max click is 2. Now, A3's left point has come, then it is added. So, max click is 3. Then what happens? A1's right point has come. So, A1 you remove. So, max click still remains 3, I have only 2 fellows here. Now, now after that A3's last point has come, 
So, A 3 is also removed. Now, the, the number of element is 1, but max click remains 3. Now, A 4's first point has come. So, A 2, A 4, there are 2, but still, okay. And, and now, A 5 has come, say A 2, A 4, A 5, again max click becomes 3. A 5 has come. Now, A 4 gets removed, then A 2 gets removed, then A 6 comes. So, A 6, A 5 is there then A 5 gets removed and A 6 gets removed. So, when I scan from left to right <coughs> and keep adding something into the basket when I see a left point and remove them from the basket when I see a right point, I can go and find out what is the size of the maximum click, right? right? So, if there are n intervals to sort them in some order takes n log n time. After that, to find the maximum click it takes just order 2 n time or order n time. Okay. So, the point is given an interval graph, I can go and find the size of the maximum click in order n time, yeah, order n log n time, where n is the number of intervals. Are you able to get this? Yes or no? Yes, no? Yes. So, there are 2, 3 clicks here A 2, A 1 and A 3 and A 2, A 4 and A 5 that also we forgot. Okay. I thought A 2, A 4 and A 5 is also a triangle in the sense they are at this. Okay. Now, why, why are we learning this in the context of register spilling? Okay. Now, what will happen is suppose you are going to design an architecture. Now, you are expected to go and run uh, some programs on that. So, this architecture need not be a general purpose computer, it can be a high performance computing, it can be a computer for doing database, it can be a uh, database transactions, it can be a computer which is trying to do a web based transaction, it can be a computer which is doing some digital signal processing, it can be a mobile phone, it can be a baseband computer, it can be a computer that needs to sit in a router. So, we could have several types of processors today, network processor, embedded processor, you know, uh, uh, my control, my programmable logic controller class processor, microcontroller class processor, de desktop class processor, server class processor, what more? We can keep on listing more. For every type of uh, processing today, we have some workload. Workload is the type of programs that we will execute. A collection of such type of programs, it basically is called a benchmark suit. Suppose I want to design a, a server class machine today, it is let us say web server, then there are benchmark suits which will be representative programs that will run on your architecture. These are available. These are available at a huge cost. This is a big business. Selling benchmark today is a business. So, there are many benchmark suits that are available. Let me just name some of them. You go to Google and find out more about them. Spec is a benchmark. EMBC is a EEMBC is a benchmark. There are uh, database benchmarks. There are web based benchmarks. There are benchmark for network processing. What is a, it is called benchmark suit. Why we call it a suit? It will be a collection of programs which are representative programs that will be running on your system. We have mobile benchmarks today. Now, when I am designing an architecture for say some, some field X to solve some problem X, for example, I want to do something for microcontrollers, microcontrollers that sit in your washing machine, your things, etc. Right? Simple, simple microcontrollers, microcontrollers that even control your nuclear reactor all small and big things. Now, there are some embedded benchmark, EMBC actually gives you a set of embedded benchmarks. So, you take these benchmark pro programs right, and do what we call as a liveliness analysis. What do you mean by a liveliness analysis? Now, let us go back to compilers. I want to teach some very interesting fact about compilers. Compilers are in two parts. 
So when the compiler, a single compiler co comprises two parts, one is what you call as architecture independent part. Another is architecture dependent part. Architecture independent part and architecture dependent part. In the architecture dependent part, you do all your code optimization, first code generation and code optimization. That is you translate the code into the machine language of your target architecture. Suppose it is x86, I translate into x86 assembly programs, right. While the architecture independent part takes your C code or whatever high level code and make it into what we call as a three address code. This is basically an intermediate representation. A three address code is nothing but one op code like add and etc and three operands, operand uh, D, operand S1, operand S2. This is how a three address code looks like. Where operand D is the destination operand, S1 and S2 are source operands. So your entire program is translated into an intermediate representation which is a three address code in which I would have three or two, two, three or less than three operands. And the maximum size is I will have a destination operand, two source operands, okay. So this is basically a three address code. Now this three address code is basically translated to what? To the corresponding machine code. Now this type of constructing a compiler is extremely useful for designing the next generation architecture because the first part when I compile, I can compile it on any machine and that is independent of your architecture. Now, I am trying to design an architecture. So I need a compiler which will give me something which is independent of this architecture. So this two stage construction of the compiler, what sometimes they call it as this is the front end and this is the back end. This two stage construction of the compiler is extremely useful for me to design my architecture, correct? So the front end and the back end. So what I do? I want to design a new architecture. I take all, so suppose I want to do it for say uh, web transactions. I just take all the benchmarks, representative benchmark for web transaction. I compile it using any compiler and I stop it at the first at the front end. So I will have the three address intermediate representation of all my programs, okay. Now, now the three address in, uh, uh, implementation would be something like add R1, R2, R3, uh, subtract R4, R1, R, R2, uh, add R6, R1, R2, R4 and again add R1, R5, R6, okay. Now this is an intermediate representation. So I will just stay, I will keep it as O, right, sorry. I do not want to confuse it as registers. So I will say O1, can you just say R1, R2, R3, right? O1, O2, O3, what was sub? O4, O1, O2. O4, O1, O2, add, next term? O6, O1, O4. O6, O1, O4 and O1? O5, O6. O5, O6. Uh, these are operands. Now, when I do O2, O3, see 
in an instruction whatever is there on the left hand side is the updated is the variable which I am updating okay right and what essentially I am I also call it as I am defining the value of that variable whatever is on the right hand side I am only using that value right for example in this add o1 o2 o3 I used o2 and o3 this is nothing but o1 equal to o2 plus o3 this is the right hand side and this is the left hand side I use the variables on the left hand side I used please note here I use the variable on the left hand side to define or update the variable on the right hand side. So, O1 <coughs> is valid it comes to life whenever it is defined and that life or that avatar of O1 okay, is valid till when? till it again gets updated you are getting my point. So, a variable or a operand actually comes to life when it is updated or defined that is it is in the first entry of this uh, three address code or when a model it has an equation like O1 equal to O2 plus O3 it is on the left hand side of the equation and its its lifetime is there till it does not die or its new avatar starts only after when it is defined next and in this avatar it need not be useful always till it is used it is uh, it is uh, you know uh, uh, it is it is alive after you stop using you can go and redefine it later but if you stop using at some point then it is almost dead okay so so let us take this so there are four instructions let us call it as t1 t2 t3 t4 because the program is going to execute in this order let us say it, uh, add is going to get executed in t1 uh, then this will be t2 is t1 plus 1 t3 is t1 plus 2 etc so every one one unit of time it is going to so let us draw the timeline here So, for O1, it will start with T1 and end with T3 because T4 again it is going to get defined. Now, the next avatar of O1 will start here and it, it can go wherever it wants, right. Similarly, O2 <coughs> uh, right uh, just to make that thing little bit interesting let us make this O2 O1 started at T1 and it is valid till T3 okay after that O1 is not used assume the O1 is not going to be used similarly O2 started somewhere okay and it stopped at T2 okay now and again it is going to start at T4 and probably it will go for some. So, O3 started uh, somewhere and it stopped let us say O3 was here till T1 O3 was here and let me say that this is also 3. Okay, it is going to be used till T4. Because O3 is used till T4. So it started somewhere and it is going on. And O4 may be there, it was not there for add. O4 again starts at T2. And let me say this is O4. T2 and it goes on. O4. And O6 actually starts at T3. Right? 
right. Now, at any point of time, if I can maintain all the live variables in registers, I am done. Okay. If I can maintain all the live variables in registers, that is enough for me, right. My, pro my program is going to execute fast. So, for example, at T1, what are all the live variables? O1, O2, O3, all the three are live variables. If all the O1, O2 and O3 are available in register, then please note that T1, the add operation will go very fast. When I go to T2, please note that O1, O2, O3 and O4, right, are live variables. If I have all of them in registers, I can do that thing f very fast. No, sorry, uh, yeah, O3 is still there, right. Now, in T3 again, now I see O1, O3, O4, O6 and so on. So, if I have four registers, I can do the whole thing very fast, right. There are five variables there, O1, O2, O3, O5, O4 and O6. But if I have four registers, I can do it very fast. Suppose I had only three registers, what would have happened? Since the load store architecture, O1, O2, O3 will be on registers. Then, uh, uh, then I, I want uh, next when I want O4, O1, and O2, O3 should have been sent to. When I come to this particular instruction, O3 should have been sent to where? Memory. I should have moved O3 to memory, and then I can use O1, O2, and O4. Correct. So, this is example of a register spill. Are you able to follow this? Because when I move off O3 to memory, at this point again I need O3, at T4 I need O3 here. So, I have to bring it back from memory. Are you able to follow? Right? So, if I do not have 4 registers here, then there is a certainty that there will be a register spill. If I have 4 registers, this particular snapshot can be done with all the variables maintained in registers and which is necessary, right. In a load store architecture, it is a must that all the variables of non load store operations are in registers, right. So, we, so how do I calculate? So, what is this representing? This is again a set of intervals. I can take the, I can, I can construct a graph here from this interval, right. And the size of a click is equal to the at any point of time the size of overlapping the number of overlapping intervals represent the size of the click the size of the maximum click tells me the maximum number of variables that are going to be live at any point in this program right the size of the maximum click of this interval graph size of the maximum click of this interval graph basically tells me the maximum number of variables that are going to be live at any point in this program, does it not? Right. So, now given this interval diagram, now I can construct an interval graph as we did in the previous part and on this, sorry, sorry okay. I, I can construct an interval graph and from that I can find the maximum click and that maximum click will tell me for this benchmark program. This is the maximum number of variables that will be alive at any point of time. And so, if I have that many number of registers, I will, I can execute that program without any register spilling, correct. So, what do you do? I take the entire set of benchmark programs, I take the entire set of benchmark programs and in these benchmark programs, I do the liveliness analysis. This is called a liveliness analysis. How long a particular variable is alive? That is what you are doing, right? in the in the uh, in this here how long a particular so i do this liveliness analysis construct interval graphs find the maximum click of these interval graphs and that maximum of those maximum clicks size of the maximum would be the number of general purpose registers i would like to have now if that is too high then we will strike a balance with a caution that yes for some classes of benchmark programs, even within benchmark, you could have varieties of benchmark program. Some classes of benchmark programs, this will have memory spilling and it will take some more time. Okay. 
able to follow? So, this is how we go and decide on the maximum number of registers while making an architecture. Are you getting this? So, let us very quickly, I am looking at load store architectures, load store architectures, I need to have every operation done on registers, I cannot afford to have memory spilling. Compilers have two phases, a front end phase and a back end phase. I am designing the architecture, so there cannot be a back end for my compiler. So, that is that those, this type of a compiler constructions helps us. Now, we go and look at the front end of that compiler, we get what we call as a three address code. From the three address code, we go and do a liveliness analysis, we construct an interval graph, find the maximum click of this interval graph and that will tell me for all the benchmarks and that will tell me the maximum number of G GPRs I need to have. Okay. This is okay. So, this is one very nice example where graph theory is used, concepts in graph theory are used for constructing architecture. I just want to cover this in this course because you get a link uh, to the other courses that you are studying. So, when you go and sit in some math course or graph theory course, do not think it is waste of time for computer scientists. It is very, very useful for computer scientists. Okay. Right? Any doubts? Yes, you had a doubt. So, what are the valid operations in the analysis? Like add sub bar, you have mentioned add and sub. Anything it may be. See, as long as, see, with the variable I can do, as long as I am getting defined, whether it is true add, div, sub or some operation which you and me define, some fuse, multiply, add, something like that. As long as I, my value changes, that variable becomes alive till it is, keep, it, is, it is being used. Somewhere you stop using it, then you say goodbye. So, in the compiler course, the first part of your compiler course, probably one month or even lesser than one, you will learn what is a three address code. The three address code will have some generic set of operations. And, and the structure as I have shown you in this place, right? This, this type of a structure, right? And from that you do and you can decide, okay? Because this does not need an architecture. Okay. You can use C compiler for any, so the front end is independent of architecture. So, I just use a C compiler and just say do the front end part alone. So, I do not, I do not need to use a C compiler for x axis architecture or anything. This is, this is architecture independent. I stop at the middle. I cut the compiler into two halves. So, let us take even an exercise compiler or an ARM compiler. No problem. I will remove off the bottom portion. Then both the compiler are same. Normally, how do you construct C compilers? You have one compiler with a machine independent part, architecture independent part. Then you have an architecture dependent part. So, the front end of all GCCs will be the same. The back end only will change. So, I take just the front end and generate this three address code and do this analysis. So, where do you compile this program? You can compile, you can run the compiler on any x86 or any Timbuktu machine. As long as I get the three address code. After that, I do the analysis on that same Timbuktu machine. But finally, from that, I will find out how many GPS are necessary for my my machine. Correct? Is it okay?